Hi there, my name is David Batsoffen and I host a travel blog called Travel and Things. And currently I'm doing a series called In Conversation With. And today I find myself in conversation with Tony Jackman, who is a writer, who is an author, who is a chef, and some people call him a raconteur. But what does Tony call himself? Tony, how are you? Hi. Hi, David. Th thanks so much for having me on. It's good to chat to you again. It must be, what, I think three years nearly since we last chatted. At least. And then you brought food into my radio studio. So, And now all I have is a cup of tea here. I did. I think it was a uh, lemon it was, drizzle cake, I think. It, it, it was indeed. It was, was indeed. Sorry. And not only did you leave me with the cake, you left me with the plate, which we still have. Oh, goody. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> yes. before, yes, two things. Firstly, where are you currently? And who is yeah. the woman looking over your shoulder? Okay. Well, these things are tied together very closely. Okay. Because this is Craddock in the Eastern Cape. And that lady used to live in Craddock in the Eastern Cape. Uh, and there's a museum in town which is, uh, when she was a teenager, was her, her home for a mm. few years. And that is, of course, Olive Schreiner. Oh, of course. The writer and activist, as I always try to remind people. Yes, she was a writer, a novelist, but she, and a writer of wonderful essays mm. uh, about socio-political matters of her day, some of which are still matters of our time, a century later. And um, but but she, but she was an activist as well, and she's she's my my hero really, and um, yes. So this is Craddock Eastern Cape, where we have lived for we're in our sixth year. So come November, it'll be six years since since we arrived here. But your route to Craddock was rather circuitous, wasn't it? Because you didn't start off in Cape Town. I mean, in in Craddock. In Craddock. No, no, not at all. Um, we, you know, I, I mean, I was born and brought up in a town called Aranyamut in what was then Southwest Africa and what is now Namibia. And um, I lived in Cape Town from the age of 14 for a very, very long time. Um, at some point, we went to live in Sutherland in another part of the Karoo, the Karoo Hoogland in the Northern Cape. And two years later, we came to our senses and went back to Cape Town. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> what was Sutherland like? Let's, let's pause for a uh, moment. Let's, let's talk about Sutherland. Sutherland has a sort of a, a, a couple of places in uh, my heart and life, in that I have a lot of fond memories of the places where, for example, I learned to play bull or patank, as, as it's also called. And... Um, why are you and learning to play a French pastime it's, in a it's, it's town? The, yeah, you, should have, you should have yeah. been playing. Um, what what it's is the? Thing. No, but what what do they play with the horseshoes? What's that called? Oh, with the horseshoes. I'm not sure. Yeah. Not, something like no, no, something no but, um, the 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 thing with the batons that the Afrikaans people play. Also, yes, yeah, gay, of course, yeah. I've never played that. But that's what the you learn in Sutherland. You don't learn that. bull in Sutherland. You learn bull you in do. Europe somewhere. <laughs> there are people in, in the Karoo and in the Winelands who love to play bull. Very pretentious. Very pretentiously in the Winelands. In the Karoo, you just play with the drink, with vodka and lots of vodka. Fair enough. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So we, we were talking about Sutherland, I think. Yes. And, um, it's... Oh, it's a difficult place to live in. You know, when you say cold, I mean, goodness, I mean, Craddock gets cold, Grahamstown, where we were for a while, gets cold, you know, I mean, Joburg gets cold where you yeah. are, but, but Sutherland, that's another kind of cold. That's <laughs> something else. And, and the, I, I, I quite like the wild, bracing charm, mm. <laughs> charms maybe, <laughs> not quite the word for it, of <laughs> Sutherland. But uh, I think there's a limit to how long most people would stay there. You know, those winters are so harsh. It's, it's, not, the a, it's not a retirement are, place uh, then. Sorry, I spoke, got, over, I, I spoke over you. It's, it's not for um, retirement then. 
Well, it might be for some people, but it's not for me. <laughs> <laughs> Retirement is not for me. I have, I have no interest in retiring. <laughs> Touch wood that I don't have to, I hope. So, so from Sutherland, you went where? Uh, we went back to Cape Town, back into newspapers. Mm -hmm. uh, along the way, uh, I know, well, uh, look, we used to, the, 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 the sequence is this. While living in Cape Town, we're talking late 90s, into the early 2000s, we, in the late 90s, we bought a house, a cottage in Sutherland for the grand price of 34,000 Rand. Right. And a few months later, we bought a second house for 25,000 Rand. <laughs> and and uh, circumstance transpired to take us to the UK. Um, in 2002, we were there for four years, just short of four years, and uh, from Cape Town to the UK, to right. a town called Chichester, which is the county town of West Sussex. And we had uh, four wonderful years there. And then we decided we wanted the big sky again. And, you know, the ceiling of grey, I used to always talk about the ceiling of grey over your head. I don't remember seeing a single star in those four years in England. You don't see stars from most places, you know. Yeah. It just isn't a, a part of life like it is in the Karoo, or I'm sure mm. in Joburg, if you block out the other buildings and the like. Yeah. Um, so th when we came back to South Africa, we, in 2006, May, um, we hadn't really thought it through. And, you know, um, we were sort of close to returning when we looked at each other and said, realize we don't have a home in Cape Town. <laughs> Do you have two houses in Sutherland? We might have to go there. <laughs> so we did. We thought, well, and, and Di actually said to me, my wife Di, Diane Kassir, she said to me, well, Tones, you know, how often have you talked of one day owning a restaurant, having a restaurant? And we have these two houses and I said well yeah we could live in one and turn the other into a restaurant and that's what we did and we had that for two years and we uh, made a, a, a pleasant living off it for two years I had mm -hmm. a lot of great memories because I mean there's so much sociability and conviviality just in while well, in, in having a little sort of mom and pop restaurant despite the the occasional difficulty of keeping it going Mm. But, you know, we were very pleased that for two years we kept it going, had enough income to make a living. And that's really all we wanted from it. But then we went back to Cape Town um, because, as I said, there's a limit to how long one will stay. Most of us will stay in a town quite that isolated. It's a very isolated town. And, and went straight back into newspapers again. So went back, both of us, to our proper careers. And, and stayed there for, I think, another seven or eight years after that. And then you decided it was time to pack up once more. You're always one for well, getting off, you know, road trips that end elsewhere. Yeah, it's, these things tend to claim me. You know, <laughs> we had no plans to live in Craddock. We only came to Craddock by chance in the first place, but there's a story there in that we had now, so going back from 2010 to 1993. So in 1993, I, I was freelance. <clears throat> and I had um, pitched a story idea to the editor of The Motorist, which was the then Automobile Association magazine, mm -hmm. long before AA Traveller came along. So um, the, the, what I pitched was a story of, I plotted an alternate route between Cape Town and Peter Maritzburg, Durban. In other words, normally you'd go either along the garden route, Trans Sky, et cetera, to Durban, mm -hmm. or you'd get hit the N1 all the way to Bloemfontein. Then you'd get up to Winburg and the head across the, uh, the Free State through uh, ultimately Bethlehem and then Harrismith and then of course down into KZN. Right. So instead of that I plotted a route that went somewhere between those two and one of the towns on the 
uh, route. I mean, I've literally plotted this route on a map, thought, well, then we'll go to that town, and then we'll go to uh, Stainsburg, and then, oh yeah, there's Hofmer, what's next? Oh, then we'll go to Craddock, and so on and so on. And then organized accommodation in the various places. And of course, we didn't have Google in those days, but however I I found out, I don't remember what, how we found things out before Google, whatever it was, pre-Google, I pre-Googled. <laughs> you found people. <laughs> yeah. uh, asked, uh, asked people, sent a pigeon. Yes. <laughs> no, but in those anyway, days, Tony, these small towns had tourism um, offices that you could phone and they would help phone. you. I probably phoned. Yeah, now they and, those yeah, offices yeah. are long closed. Yeah, uh, so somebody told me, look, there are these little toast house in Craddock, in Market Street in Craddock, little old houses that have been uh, renovated, renewed, made good, and is everything okay? You yeah, the right? reason that I'm, I'm listening to you, the reason that I'm looking is I no. thought I had... I had an, a picture of those town, those Tainhase, because I, I lived yeah. in Craddock for a year. Oh, so yes, I, know I, knew, it, I, I know it well. Yeah. So I was just looking for the image, but I don't have it yes. up at the moment. No, everything's Very okay. Very colorful. Okay. Yeah. So, so yes, so they said the, there are these, turns out six Tainhase, which um, we knew little else about, except that we always loved the idea of these old Karoo houses full of mm. antique furniture and all the character, you know, and that's what we were hoping for. So eventually, you know, we landed up in, in, in Craddock. It was actually on the way back that we stayed here. I think we had gone to Peter Maritzburg on one of the regular routes and that this, the alternate route was the return. Coming back. So we pull into Craddock, never had been here before, 1993 and find Market Street, find a house where there was reception, get shown to a little house across the road called Upstal, and uh, which was full, as it is today, of exactly what I've just described. Mm. You know, beautiful Ote Tzedanga, and uh, very authentic, just too beautiful. And uh, there, were, there were six of them at that time, and so when I went back home to Cape Town, when we got home, I wrote my story for the motorist and it had been the absolute highlight of the, of the journey. And I raved, I went on and on and on about it in the piece <laughs> that I wrote. And this is not something I take credit for, but Sandra Antrobus, who's now uh, one of our closest friends, mm. <laughs> all these years later, she she is the person who had who had bought uh, six dilapidated houses cottages and done that renovating. Mm. And so time moves on. We go home, write the story. It's published. Never come to Craddock again for seventeen years. Wow. So now we jump to the, yeah. Never come through again. It just you know it was. We'd said, oh, we must go back there. Remember those places? And 17 years later, you know, all of these things, Sutherland and the UK mm. and so on, uh, have happened in the interim. And so now we're back in Craddock. We booked into the, the Victoria Manor Hotel and Toso. So, so by now, she not only had bought up nearly all the rest of the houses in the street, not all of them, sadly, but most of them, That's had done the, the same work for me. So that they're that, all beautiful. That hotel is the big white hotel on the corner, is it? On is the it not? corner with the green roof, yes. Where I lived. I you lived, lived in that? I lived in that hotel for a year in yes. 1974. Oh, it was very different then. I should imagine so. No, but yeah, no, Sandra has changed it a lot. Um, the, the entrance is now in Market Street. The entrance, I mean, it's still part of the hotel, but it's not yeah. used as the entrance anymore. Okay. It's off that, you know, the main street that goes yeah. past all the traffic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not as inviting a, a position, really. And so anyway, so, so by 2010, as I say, she had built 
she had renovated as many as I think 31 or 32 units, uh, most of them old character houses, mm. uh, decorated them all individually with the same character, but each has its own style. And some of them are, are, are Dutch in origin and some of them are, are settler, British settler in or, origin. So they're not all the same architectural style or the same feel really. Right. And, and she had by then also at some stage along the way, she'd bought the old hotel on the corner and then she'd done, you know, she, so now the, the basically it's the entire, it's pretty much right. just about the entire street. Wow. And um, so, so we're, we're in Craddock, it's I think late May. So it's, um, yeah, late May of that year. And we'd booked in, you know, not expecting to be remembered. I mean, 17 years is a very long time. <laughs> yeah. We hadn't announced ourselves. We just booked, you know, yeah. and that was it. We weren't trying to get any attention focused on us. Yeah. There was no need to. We didn't know the people. Um, we didn't remember their names or anything like that. And so she books us into, they book us into the Lion House, which is my favorite of the Tosa. So right mm -hmm. across the road from the entrance to the hotel in, in Market Street. And we uh, get ready for dinner. Later on, we go across the road into the beautiful lobby and turn right into the red dining room, some painted dark red. Mm -hmm. And we have our starter, they have a Karoo buffet in there, which is wonderful. And we have our starter and then we're chatting and having a sip of wine. And there's right at the end of, it's a long room, right at the end of the room, near the double doors in the old fashioned dining, hotel dining room where the double street doors. Uh, there's this, this auntie with bouffant dark hair and a big red coat. And she's going from table to table, chatting to people and being hospitable and she gets to she gets to our table and she looks at us and she fixes me with both eyes very sharply and says, You are Tony Jackman. I said, um yeah. <laughs> if you want me to be, said, I'll be. <laughs> yeah. And she I said, I looked at her inquisitively and she said, and she speaks very emphatically, always does, I now know, because I know, now know her very well. And she said, you are the reason for my success. <laughs> I said, how, what, yeah. what, how, why, why, why would that be? <laughs> um, and and, and I, I don't accept that. I, I must, I always add the writer when telling the story that I don't accept that it would have happened anyway. Right. But she says that, um, she says, no, you wrote that story about me in the AA magazine. And Tony, the phone never stopped ringing to this day, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> and... I uh, love that woman. She's a wonderful I, woman. I seem to think that also that's, as a result, I, I seem to think, Tony, also as a result of you telling me about your, your time in Craddock, that I actually interviewed her on one of my radio shows many years ago. Yes, yes. Yeah, because the interesting thing for me, and I don't know if it's still there, is when I lived in, in Craddock, there was a um, OK Bazaars in the middle of town. And, and being um, a railway employee, I couldn't afford a car in those days. So yes. I, I bought a bicycle from the OK Bazaars and it was a jet jungle racing bicycle. Oh, right. And because I used to listen, I think we all did to jet jungle back in the day when it was on Springbok radio. Years later, I come to discover right. that the yes. artist who drew jet jungle is none other than my father-in-law, Dor Fedler. So I now is have. Yeah. Yep. So this is one. Oh, of, really? Yeah, so this is oh, one of his Jet Jungle originals. The bicycle is long gone, but I have the cartoon. Jet Jungle. I remember that. 
Wasn't it Brian Saunders? Saunderson, wasn't it? I can't re- was it, I can't remember who was the who the voice was. Um, I think so. On the radio thing, anyway. Yeah. If 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 I was quicker on the keyboards, I would look it up. But uh, right. I don't know how long it would take. I'll, we'll find out, okay. and we'll I'll add it into the the brief description uh, when of this video. <laughs> Jet Jungle was voiced by. <laughs> I'll, I'll pre I'll pre Google it for you. Okay, as as you said, um, uh, Craddock is a is a totally different place. And then when my dad died in Port Elizabeth, and and my mom was moving to um, Howick, um, she couldn't drive that far because they only had a city golf and it had no power steering. So my wife and I said, all right, this was two thousand and four, if I remember correctly. We'll come down. We'll fly down to PE, and then we'll drive the car back to Johannesburg. And it was this time of the year because uh, my daughter was performing in Grahamstown. So we stopped off, saw her play in Grahamstown and then drove through to Craddock. And it was bone chillingly cold that night. Yeah. yeah. You sort of go out. I'd forgotten how cold it was. And we got out the yeah. next morning and you can't leave in the early mornings because the car is frozen over and to try and get the oh, ice yeah. is almost impossible. Oh um, yeah, no, exactly. My windscreen gets frozen over. Yeah, frequently. and then the other favorite place that I liked in Craddock, and we, we did frequent it on that particular trip, is the spa in the center of town, because everybody yeah. knows everybody, and that's where it all happens. That's, that's the beauty of small town South Africa. You know, you're walking down the street and somebody will stop you and they'll say, Tony, where, why are you here? You've got a doctor's appointment this afternoon. You can't be yeah. on the street at three o'clock. That's where you're meant to be. Why are you here? <laughs> in those days, hey, pre-lockdown, I remember those days. <laughs> yeah. it's it's what is what is Craddock now? What is Craddock like currently? <laughs> um, under lockdown, it must be almost a ghost town because nobody's driving through it. Um, <clears throat> it, I, I would, I wish it were more of a had more of a ghost town feel. I, we see so many people out and about now. Now that we're further into lockdown, it was, it was very ghost town like in the first, say two months of lockdown, but right. under this, well, it's um, a lot more people around. Yeah. A lot more cars going past our house, um, people walking by. But Have people, you... mostly people are behaving, wearing their masks, their yeah. sanitize, sanitization <laughs> everywhere. Uh, but we are, we're pretending, you know, that it's level one or two. And I mean, level five. Level five, yeah. And we're pretending that we're, we're behaving as if, as if everything's out to get us and we're, we're staying home. We bought and that, that's the way you should be. I mean, I went... In September. I've, I've, yeah. I've been doing the same thing. People say to me, what are you doing? I said, I'm a non-traveling travel writer. Do you know how frustrating that is? Um, that hence is. these in-conversations with. I mean, I went out for the first time this morning. I had to go and get medication and one or two other um, things. So I, I, it's the first time in 15 days that I've been outside of my gate. Um, oh, really? And it's, it's the chemist, worst. Our chemist delivers to us. No, I sort of figure, no, let me go, you know, just, just let me go out once. Uh, my daughter yeah. has put herself into lockdown in Cape Town and she's been there from day one. She only leaves her apartment every second week for food. Yeah. And she says, then she eats well for a week. Um, she's got fresh, fresh fruit and vegetables. And then the second week she eats starch. Um, and that's yeah. how, are, are you, did you restart your restaurant, uh, Tony? No, but it was the Southern restaurant back then. When we yes. first came to live in Craddock, mm. uh, which was um, five and a half years ago, we then took over uh, for six months, took over what had been the Shriner Tea Room in Market Street, That's right. owned yeah. by the same Sandra Antrobus part of that Tosa operation. You know, that was after after years of sub-editing and newspapers in Cape Town. Mm -hmm. A certain man whose name I'm not going to mention uh, uh, came along, uh, caused mayhem where he's still causing mayhem right. in that newspaper group. And, a whole lot of us found ourselves looking for uh, new pastures elsewhere. And, and Sandra had called and said, you know, Tony, 
Um, I thought, I don't know if this would interest you, but I thought I should let you know <laughs> that after 11 years, the lease on the Shrinatirum has come up, and I just thought I'd let you know in case you wanted to take it over. Mm -hmm. And we were just in the process of, of retrenchment at independent newspapers in Cape Town in the, in the, in the aftermath of all of that, mm -hmm. uh, as were many other people who yeah. are now working elsewhere. And uh, chatted to Di, and we looked at each other and just thought, well, there's serendipity. I've often said serendipity follows me around mm -hmm. for whatever reason. And there again was some serendipity just at that time. Even so, we were uh, reluctant at first because it's a big change, you know, and we had moved to a Karoo town once before. And while it was good for a while, after two years, it had become too much. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, one thing led to another and we did move here, as obviously you know by now. And um, it's now, you know, in November, it'll be six years right. since, uh, since we arrived here, which will be three times the the length of time we were in Sutherland mm -hmm. and it still feels quite new to us. We have no thoughts whatsoever of going anywhere else. There's no thought of it at all. Um, so, so it's turned out to be a very happy uh, piece of serendipity, even though when we first drove into town, we thought, now what? Is this <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, you, it's a big thing to move to a new place and you, it is, you don't and, know what life and, in store. And also to small town South Africa. I mean, after Craddock, um, I moved to, well, I had no choice in the matter. Um, the, I was working for, at that time for the old South African railways and harbours as an apprentice. So what they would do is they would move people um, in and around the Eastern Cape. And instead of moving somebody else to Noport, they took me from Craddock, put me in Noport, and put somebody else in Craddock. And Noport, I'm sorry, if they need to, to give South Africa an enema, that is where they stick the tube. Um, it, was the, it, it had only two things going for it when I was there. It was the fourth largest railway junction in South Africa, and it had the uh, highest number of teen pregnancies. Uh, anywhere i think okay. in the eastern cape because that's all they've that read Un unwed 15 year old mothers it was scary uh, but but, yeah, but yeah. it was an interesting year it really, <laughs> really was yeah but uh, is that you, you, the free state where is that what no put yeah where's no put is just past middleburg so if you go from craddock you're going back towards colesburg oh there yes um, you don't even go into you, you, you don't go through it anymore, Tony, because what happened is you now bypass it because of the the end road. Um, yes. and there's no reason for people to go in, but we'd gone to PE, we'd gone to PE once, my wife, my daughter, and I, and I wanted to show them the hotel that I'd lived in for the year. And we drove yes. in, and there was just a pile of bricks. So I stopped to inquire and there'd been a gas explosion and the whole hotel had, had blown up. And because there was another hotel in town, they didn't need two hotels anymore. So they just left the pile of bricks. I think I brought home a brick as a, as a, a piece of memorabilia, which I kept for a short while and then, and then tossed it. But just to get back to, to what you were saying. So the you opened the restaurant or you opened a restaurant again in Craddock for a short period of time. Yeah. Um, that really um, was very helpful to have at that time. Mm. You know, it gave us a focus and anchor something to do and also yeah. somewhere to live. We lived in the in the front bedroom of the property right. uh, for six months while buying a house. Um, which is where I am now, and um, running the rest of the place as you know, the, as the restaurant. Yeah. Two dining rooms and two rooms that were a kitchen, and then the the, the as I say, the big bedroom was home. <laughs> <laughs> All of our furniture was in that one room. Everything there was hardly room to move in there. But then uh, Daily Maverick came up for me. Um, again serendipity and i ended up uh, um, uh, being 
the sub, there was only one of us, and it was me, uh, for Daily Maverick um, from, from then onwards and from till now, mm. um, you know, right through the leaks period and all of that. You, you talk about the Daily Maverick, and I suppose uh, you've seen um, the fact that uh, certain, there is a certain media house that not only has it closed, one lot has closed off the entire magazine section, um, good, bad, or indifferent. The other one is busy closing down many of their newspapers. And I think some people are going, yeah, comma is a bitch. Um, and other people are going, well, maybe we'll get rid of some bad journalists now because there, there is some what I, that I've termed cut and paste journalists in, in the industry at the moment who are just looking for those clickbait words. Um, they're not journalists in the truest sense of the word. They just want to suck you in um, and then make you read stories that are really badly written. You know, um, when that man, that man... Um, you could call him Voldemort, him. Tony. Voldemort survey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, when, when that man... Um, took over independent newspapers and started that reign of whatever happened. Mm. Um, a, a lot of the people, and it, it, was, it was mostly senior people, people with decades of experience who, who left. Yeah. And who were, shall we say, not encouraged to stay, to put it <laughs> kindly. <Yeah. laughs> um, and Daily Maverick has picked up a lot of those people. You know, there's yeah. quite a few of us working for Daily Maverick. Mm. Because Daily Maverick, you know, my, my wonderful uh, uh, employer's um, uh, approach is to, to, to seek and to employ people with depth of knowledge. And, yes. You know, that, that, that's... that's, that's uh, that brain full of that mind mm. full of experiences that count for something in journalism and in and in good writing um and i've you know it's it 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 could easily sound as if i'm simply saying nice things about the people i'm working for i would say this uh, i will say this one day when i've been away from them for a long time, you know, if I move on to something else, or yeah. life carries me elsewhere. You know, I will always say this: that these are fantastic people to work for, and uh, I, I don't remember ever having been happier in a newspaper since I started out at the Cape Times in the late seventies under Tony Hurd, mm. um, with whom I'm still in contact very happily. That's and wonderful. Janet Hurd is. Um, his daughter is, uh, she and I work together closely every day. Uh, she's one of our, our managing editors. Do you feel that print journalism as we knew it will not, with what's happened now and maybe going forward, because nobody really knows where this is going or how long this is going to last. Do you feel then that print journalism is winding down and things are going to move onto a digital platform? More I, so I than they are to... already. Let me let me phrase it. With <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. You know, when we lived in the UK, uh, uh, and that was like 16, 17 years ago, or thereabouts. Then uh, everybody was saying, "Oh, it's it's over for you know, it's all mm. starting to wrap up. Everything's moving online. Print titles are closing, and they were, and they still are more so now." But then you always get those that are resilient and, and somehow survive and even thrive. I think it will take a lot, lot more mm. to, to kill it off. I don't, think it's, I don't think it's all going to go online in, in our lifetimes or in even our children's lifetimes. I think it will take a long time before it's all gone digital. Um, but obviously more and more will go. Yeah. But, you see, um, I'm, um, there's also people who want to hold the paper, hold the magazine and page through it. Exactly. And there's still a lot of people in the world who want that. You see, I'll put up my hand to that. I'm one of those. I like yeah. the feel of paper. I can't read yeah. off a Kindle. 
I want to read a novel in its original form. I want to feel the paper. Yeah, I want to smell, specifically magazines. There's nothing better than the smell of a magazine when you crack yeah. it for the first time, you know, those type of things. Yeah. And, and I miss that. Um, I also, I mean, if I go back to my childhood, I miss the old annuals. My parents had a bookshop yeah. in Port Elizabeth called the Novelty Bookshop. It was a forerunner yeah. to the CNA type of thing. And in November, yes. um, we'd get the, oh, the all the annuals, but they were yeah. embargoed until yeah. December. But ah. I was allowed to read them. None of my friends were. So I would read oh, Bino yeah. and all of those sort of things. I knew, I knew them all in December. Desperate Dan. But, you know, in the Desperate Dan. Yeah, Roy, Roy all, of the Rovers. Roy of the Rovers, all of that sort of thing. I'd, really, I'd already read in November. And then they went on the shelves yeah. in December. I don't think they do those anymore. But that being said, I suppose I everything, I mean, there's a, there's a daily newspaper in Johannesburg. We shan't start mention its name. But if it wasn't for a certain supermarket chain, that newspaper would not be published because the, that's what carries the advertising, six pages of yeah. supermarket advertising, full pages in the center of the, of the, the newspaper, you know. You, you think what that yeah. newspaper used to be back in the day and the inserts at, that had that that came with like the tonight and those sort of things that we all remember with fondness gone well the thing is remember the the old um the the cape argus as it used to be mm -hmm. was as thick as that yeah not as thick as keith richards no. as thick as this book F funny you pick up that book because I have just been talking about, I've just started reading, I'm battling to read that book. I really and truly am. Um, I love it, but, um, but now, yeah, three now, pages. <laughs> now the Cape Argus is as thick as that. Yeah. The small book of wartime cookery. <laughs> Honestly, today, I believe it's much, much thicker than that. The Talking tonight about, section is thicker than yeah, that. Yeah. Talking it's about nice. cookery, when, when you had your restaurant, uh, did you have a signature dish that you enjoyed cooking on a regular basis or that people beat a path to your door for, even though Sutherland was bitterly cold? My signature dish, I've got two or three. Um, lamb shanks slow cooked with uh, fresh oregano, thyme, and mint, garlic, soy sauce, and lemon juice, and olive mm. oil. Mm. I still get that, and uh, it's just a wonderful way to make uh, lamb. Mm. And then Peru lamb pie. Right. And um, I used to make then a Cape brandy tart. Um, ever since being here, I've made pecan pie. Um, okay. I just, I was at the door. I made two the other day. I make them in bat. In, in, in pairs of two, mm. brace if you like, of pecan pies. <laughs> and I was actually just at the door, and this is why we delayed our, we delayed our, our this chat for mm. five minutes. I was about to join you when um, I got a WhatsApp from my farmer mate, Billy, saying, Sam, I'm here, I brought you some eggs. <laughs> and, and I replied saying, well, I'm about to do a radio interview, but um, I'll pop out and then I said to you, give me five, please. <laughs> give me five. <laughs> no, I, mean, you, I hope you saw that because that's what that said. Yeah, no, no. And well, I wasn't here at first. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then so I went to the door, got the two dozen lovely large jumbo farm eggs from him mm -hmm. and gave him a peek and buy in return. Fair. <laughs> that's, you see, how, this is... that's how we lived there. This is what I'm hoping, if, if COVID-19 does nothing else um, for humanity, I'm hoping that people are going to start realizing that barter is a way to go. And as long as the oh, parties all win, then banks are actually unnecessary. We can start demystifying the fact that everybody has to have vast sums of money. Because if you yeah. have something that you can, even if it's a trade, you need food, you're an electrician, you'll do some electrical work, they'll give you some food. You know, that's worked for yeah, eons, exactly. for, for millennia. Two weeks ago, 
we gave a packet of oranges from the orange tree out that window there mm. to our friends, to, to our friends here. Mm. Last week, they arrived at the door with a packet of limes from their tree. We've got oranges, they've got limes, so we can share them. Because then you know, you know what you do with the limes, Tony? Very simple, but what do you do? You put the lime in the coconut and drink <laughs> it all down. <laughs> it all down. <laughs> Come on, you've got to be quicker than that. <laughs> I used to love that song as a kid. So where, yeah. to, where to now for, Ch for Tony Jackman, aside from the Daily Maverick? What is a typical day in your life currently in, in Craddock like? Well, um, a year ago, I used to, okay, the background to this is that from when I joined Maverick in early 2016, I worked at night and I used to go to bed at three in the morning, right through until the, the Gupta Leaks period that started in 2017. Right. Until a year ago, uh, just over a year ago, I contracted pneumonia, double pneumonia, and I uh, was in a very bad way. And um, uh, one thing led to another. The upshot of that was that my doctor, I was in hospital in Cape Town, and my doctor said to me, tell me about your, there's something strange about your working life. You've talked about working at night. Tell me, and we talked about it and I answered her questions. And she looked at me sternly and shook her head and said, no, that has to stop. Give me your employer's contact details. I'm going to write to them. And she did the next day. And um, they called me and said, no arguments. You're on days now. You're working by day. Right. That's the sort of people I work for. So for the past year, um, also earlier, um, <clears throat> at the end of, um, in December, December 2018, right, just over a year and a half ago, um, I started at, thank God it's food, TGI Food, mm. which is my, it's my add-on, if you like. So I'm editor of that. It's a food platform in Daily Maverick with a weekly newsletter. goes out every Friday at 6 p.m. And so my job now is sub-editing by day and finding time in between to put together, I've got a team of writers, food writers around the country that uh, send wonderful stories and photographs to me. And I assemble those, in fact, I'm busy with that today and I'll finish it up tomorrow, this week's edition of Thank God It's Food. And so I'm doing all of that at the moment, while also um, I have been talking at a publisher who was involved in my first book, which was a, a, a book of essays, uh, uh, food essays and recipes um, that came out in 2017 when, in fact, you chatted to me at the yeah. time while I was there, right? Um, and so um, my, my publisher for, the, for that book, she, she is now on her own. She went out on her own at some point mm -hmm. between then and now. And she has said that she would welcome a manuscript from me for something else. Okay. So I'm thinking about how to put that together. And then the other thing that's happening at the moment, touch wood again, is that my play, I'm sorry, plays now and again, now and again. And my play and audience with Miss Hobhouse seems likely to get an outing in the Western Cape, and I think it's Rebecca Steele mm. in November. That's all still in the planning stages, but what would be lovely about that for me is that it's about six years since we first put it on, and it's quite a while since it was last staged anywhere. Right. And so it would be, you know, once it's been revived, then we can start looking perhaps at taking it elsewhere again and giving it a new life. So I'm yeah. hoping that by the end of this year, that play will be on, on the boards again. Wonderful. Tony, that, that particular book that you were alluding to, is that still available? Can, can people find it online or in bookstores currently? Are you talking about the play? No, 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 your book. Your oh, my book. book. No, I have some copies and, you know, if somebody were to contact me, I can arrange to courier mm -hmm. it to them or make some kind of a plan. It may be, I think it, 
I haven't looked for it for a while. Uh, you won't easily spot it in a bookstore. You know, it sold quite a lot. But I imagine they still have copies and uh, I would probably look at Take A Lot and things like that to yeah. see if it's still knocking around there. Mm, it mm. was, to be honest, I haven't looked lately, you know, um, but I imagine it's still knocking around somewhere on the periphery. And then just in wrapping up, and thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Um, thank you. you. If you could, if firstly, before I say th uh, thanks and goodbye, firstly, um, I'll give you my street address because the lamb I would like for the weekend, please, um, okay. for Sunday lunch, if you could courier that up to me. And um, if you would do a peek and pie at the same time, I will put money in okay. your account and you can put food in a courier <laughs> bag for me. It would be really nice. La lamb is always my... That lamb shank is always my downfall. It really and truly is. Um, Tony, if people want to, can they subscribe to the Daily Maverick? And if so, how do they do that? You can, and there are subscription links uh, in newsletters that we send out on okay. the website. For example, if you go to um, the main, the, the, the Daily Maverick homepage. Yeah. Um, I have for, thank God it's food, a series of ads about sort of that size. Mm. They're quite pretty to look at, um, uh, which, you know, have a subscribe. You can click, click, and it takes you through to where you can subscribe. Right. To, to, to thank God it's food or to any other okay. uh, part of Daily Maverick. All right. So if people are going to be driving down through Craddock, um, Tony's address, if you want to pick up a pecan pie and the lamb shank for me, <laughs> I won't do that. I may come no, once, once I can become a traveling travel writer again, Tony, uh, my wife and I are looking at doing a sort of road uh, trip right around South Africa, oh, uh, rather than going I overseas because I, we don't want to get on a plane. And I think we're going to start yeah. in Hanover and then Probably, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to tell her about how cold Sutherland is. And I think we'll start this yeah. time of the year and then, and then sort of go Hanover, Sutherland, those type of places, just to see if she likes, if she likes the cold. <laughs> She'll kill me. She really will. I have been in conversation with Tony Jackman. Tony, it's been wonderful talking to you. Thank you so much for, for giving of your time and telling of your stories. Thank you, David.